Now listen to the talk and answer the questions one to six. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to join the library. We're new to the district, you see.、Hmm, certainly. Well, all we need is some sort of identification with your name and address on it. Oh dear, we just moved, you see, and everything has my old address. A、uh, driving license, perhaps? No, I don't drive. No, your husband's would do. Yes, but his license will still have the old address on it. Hmm. Perhaps you have a letter addressed to you at your new house. No, I'm afraid not. We've only been there a few days, you see, and no one's written to us yet. Or what about your bank book? That's just the same. Oh dear, and I did want to get some books out this weekend. We're going on holiday to relax after the move, you see, and I wanted to take something with me to read. Well, I'm sorry, but we can't possibly issue tickets without some form of identification. What about your passport? What? Oh yes, how silly of me! I've just got a new one, and it does have our new address. I've just been to book our air ticket, so I have it on me. Ah,、oh, well, that's all right. Your ticket will be ready soon. Okay. Um, how many books am I allowed to take out? You can take four books out at a time, and you can also get two tickets to take out three magazines or periodicals. Newspapers, I'm afraid, can't be taken out. Oh, that's fine.、Uh, do you have a record library? Some libraries do, I know. Yes, we do. You have to pay a deposit of five dollars in case you damage them, but that entitles you to take out two records at a time. That's good. Could you show me where your history and biography sections are, please? Yes, just over there to your right. If there's any particular book you want, you can look it up in the catalogue, which you'll find just around the corner. You can also find a touchscreen information service on level two. Thank you. Oh. And how long am I allowed to keep the books for? Well, the normal loan period is three weeks, with two weeks extension. Oh dear, we're going away for four weeks. Can I renew them now?、Mm, I'm afraid not. You must do that at the end of three weeks. I see. Thank you very much. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions seven to ten. Well, let's go into some details. Your name, please, madam. My name is Barbara. The surname is Cooper. It's spelt as C O O P E R. Fine. And what's your contact number? If we have new books coming, we can contact you in time. Good. You can call me on seven two three six five one eight. But it's better after five p.m. You know I have to work during the daytime. Do you need the office number? I don't think so. It's enough. Could you tell me the address? I lived in King Road, but of course you need my new address. Um, it's twenty-five Saint Mary Road, Hanwell. That's H A N W E L L. Is that right? Yes. Do you need the passport number? I just brought it with me. Here you are. Yes, thank you. The number of your passport is G five seven nine eight zero nine four two. Okay, and your ticket is ready. The number is M nine three zero one two three. Thank you. Could I take a look around and check out some books? Of course, as you like. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the education officer in a museum giving a talk to school students who are about to start a one-week work placement in the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is 9 to 5 p.m., but on Monday, because it's your first day, we'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us, then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognise you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, we say put on your own casual clothing because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now... We don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well, or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence and follow up if necessary. But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday or, the most popular, when they go out on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week, and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, you'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. 
In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, there's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception, and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks, um, lunch, etc. Unfortunately, our cafe's closed at the moment, so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk, and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day, we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area, at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, what was it like in your school then, Lynn? Well, South African schools are very different from schools in Australia. For a start, children don't start their schooling until they are seven, quite a bit later than schools in Australia. What about New Zealand, Gail? We're more like Australia. I can't believe children don't go to school until they are seven. When do the parents get any free time? Well, there's still the availability of kindergartens or play schools. It's just that formal education doesn't start until later. I don't think it's such a good idea for children to have to be too academic at such a young age. They should be able to just enjoy themselves. Well, yeah, but the first school children go to isn't really very academic. It's just an opportunity for children to learn a few basic social skills by playing and learning with other children. Yes, I'd agree with that. I guess being so close, Australian and New Zealand schools must be similar then. Well, I suppose they do share a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. For example, children in New Zealand go through intermediate school, but in Australia there's only high school. That's right, isn't it, Pat? Yeah, I think so. What about South Africa, Lynn? Do you have an intermediate or high school? Oh, high school. Another difference between Australian and New Zealand education is that although both countries have state schools and private schools, our private schools are very often run by religious groups, whereas New Zealand schools are secular. That's not true. There are quite a few religious schools in New Zealand. Oh, OK. Maybe we are similar. Only a few South African schools have any religious connection, so I guess we're different. Most people go to state schools. Pat, is it true that some people from your country don't have to go to school at all? Well, that's partly true. Because of the geography of Australia, there are a lot of children who do not have access to schools, at least on a regular basis. Instead, they have a form of correspondence education, where the lessons are actually on the radio and the students send their work in by post. That way they get a lot of what they would if they were in the classroom, apart from the interaction. In New Zealand, not all students have to go to school either. Some parents have opted for homeschooling. Oh, is that like correspondence teaching? We don't really have that. 
Well, we do have correspondence schools, but homeschooling is different. With homeschooling, the parents teach the children and set them homework. They have to present a syllabus to their local education authority before they can do that. But it is becoming a more popular choice for some parents. I suppose it also suits parents' own commitments. I mean, they don't have to worry about collecting their children from school, and they can always teach over the weekend or in the evening if they want to. Is the school day normally quite long then? Not in New Zealand, but I think it can be in Australia. Yeah, that's right. I think Australia is unusual in that there are extracurricular activities which you have to go to. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. These are normally sport activities, but there are a few other options. We have activities after school for any student that is interested, but they aren't compulsory. What about in New Zealand, Gail? I had to do some sport every week. I didn't really like it, but it was part of the school day, so I guess that's not so bad. Anyway, I spent two years at boarding school, so things were a little different. Boarding school? What was that like? Well, the thing I remember most about it was the strict dress code. There were restrictions on everything. You had to wear a school uniform almost all of the time, and it had to be cleaned and ironed. The length of your skirt had to be no less than one inch above your knees when kneeling down. Sometimes we used to go out on school trips or just at weekends with a few friends, but whenever we were outside the school, we had to wear a hat. There was one teacher who always used to give me extra homework because my socks weren't pulled up, and that was in the school late in the evening. I suppose it wasn't that bad, but at the time it felt like a prison. I kept getting into trouble for something. Most of the time, I forgot something. Normally, my school badge. We had to wear that all the time in the school and out because it had our house colours on it. Wow, that doesn't sound like much fun. No, but it was a good education, I suppose. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about security in the UK. Listen to the talk and complete the statements below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In large cities, for instance London, and crowded places such as airports and stations, there is the risk of theft. We do not want you to suffer the distress of losing important documents and valuables as soon as you step onto British soil. So here are some important do's and don'ts. Don't carry more cash than you need for daily expenses. If you stay at a hotel, do ask the manager to keep large sums of cash, documents, and valuables in the hotel safe, and give you a receipt for them. This is a free service. If cash is stolen, it is very unlikely to be recovered. 
Do keep separately a note of the serial numbers on your traveller's cheques, so if they are lost, you can inform your bank. Do take particular care of bank and credit cards. Do carry wallets and purses in an inside pocket or a handbag. Don't ever leave a bag unattended, and make sure it is securely fastened when you are carrying it. Do carry jewellery and valuables such as cameras, radios, and typewriters on you or with you, and keep a note of any serial numbers. Do take special care of your passport, travel tickets, and other important documents. Documents are at risk, particularly at airports and stations, where it is obvious that most people will be carrying them. Do make a note and keep it in a safe place of the number of your passport, its date, and place of issue. This makes replacement easier if you are unlucky enough to lose it. If you don't want to carry heavy luggage around with you. You can leave it in a luggage office at most large stations and pick it up later. Keep the receipt so that you can reclaim your luggage. Check the opening hours, or you may find your luggage locked away when you need it again. If you lose any of your luggage in transit, take this up immediately with the officials of the airline or shipping line. But don't worry too much. Ninety-eight percent is found within three days. If you lose anything. Go first to the lost property office at the airport or station, as it may have been found and handed in. If you lose your luggage in the street or suspect it has been stolen rather than gone astray, find the nearest policeman who will advise you what to do. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.